Hello, welcome to Ilford High Road Baptist Church. This is our recording for Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, there's information about our, our Easter services online and then on Easter Sunday in church uh, on our website with a contact number. Please do get in touch if you would like details about joining us online for Monday Thursday Communion, Stations of the Cross on Good Friday and then the second of our morning services on Easter Sunday morning. Our reading today comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, commencing at verse 1. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you why you're doing that, tell them that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. Just as they were untying it, some of the passers bystanders asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered, just as Jesus had told them, and the bystanders let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their coats on the road, while others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people who were in the front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the coming of the kingdom of King David, our father. Praise God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple and looked round at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The Roman system was known as Angaria. An important political figure could request the use of an animal at any time. When Jesus then sends two disciples to bring him a colt to ride on, he tells them that if somebody asks, what are you doing? They should reply simply by saying, the Lord needs it. And Jesus didn't expect there to be any trouble. The owner would understand and Jesus would return the animal later. And so begins what we call the triumphal entry. Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem less than a week before Passover on the back of a young colt. How much the meaning and the significance the disciples and the crowd understood, we may never know. But Mark's account makes it clear. Maybe the crowd got caught up in the emotion of the moment and just shouted out their praises to Jesus. But the narrative of Mark shows us exactly why we should praise him. And what's more, why we should make available to Jesus not just a donkey, but our lives. First of all, we praise him because Jesus is Lord. Mark 11 shows that Jesus plans to enter the city on the back of a cult. And that will be a clear message in itself if the people can see it. And Jesus says that he, the Lord, needs that animal at that moment. Let me read verse 3 for you again. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? This is what you say to them, the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. Jesus is telling them what to say if someone asks them what they're doing. And his disciples are to say simply, the Lord needs it. Jesus has sent them. He needs it. He is the Lord. However, the Greek word for Lord, kurios, can be translated in a number of different ways, depending on the context. It could simply mean a polite way to speak to someone and say, sir. It can mean owner. It can mean master. Equally, it means Lord with a capital L referring to God, and Lord with a capital L referring to Jesus. 
Let me give you some reasons why Lord with a capital L here refers to Jesus and therefore why he is worthy of our praise. First, almost all of the Greek text that has been translated into English uses the capital letter L here. Almost all commentators understand that Jesus is speaking about himself when he says, the Lord needs it. However, there are a few who think that kurios was only used to describe Jesus much later at the end of the first century. But there are many good reasons to say that the church has always called Jesus Lord. In fact, Jesus himself used that phrase as we have seen. But again in Mark chapter 12, uh, Jesus says, Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But if you look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians, written quite early, he says it's the Holy Spirit within us who teaches us to say, Jesus is Lord. And then the cry at the end of the letter, Maranatha, O Lord, come, is in Aramaic, demonstrating that Jesus was called Lord from the beginning. Perhaps the earliest letter in the New Testament is the letter to the Galatians, written as early as A.D. 50, and it describes James as the brother of the Lord. So there's every reason for us to conclude that the word Lord refers to Jesus. The custom of Angaria marks him out as a significant and important person. But actually, he's more. Much more. He's Lord of all. And that's why we praise him, because he is Lord of all. As we read the Gospels, we see Jesus, Lord over sickness, Lord over demons, Lord over hunger, Lord over the storm, Lord over sin, Lord over death. Yes, indeed, Lord of all. And as his disciples walked with him, as they talked with him, as they listened to him, as they watched him in action, they began to realize he was more than just a teacher, more than a healer. He is Lord. And if at first, they used that word kurios to describe him as their master, whom they would follow and obey. Then, surely as we have seen, they learned that he is Lord in the full sense of deity. One day Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's Lord of all. When a week after his resurrection, Thomas finally saw him, saw the marks in his hands and his feet and his side, he fell before him and said, My Lord and my God. He's Lord of all. And when the Apostle John wrote his gospel, he begins, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, that divine word become flesh, is truly Lord. And therefore, he is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our obedience in everything. So let us praise him, because Jesus is Lord. And secondly, let us bless his name, because Jesus is King. Our reading today reminded us how they spread their cloaks on the road along with the palm branches, making like a, a red carpet or a multicolored carpet, but one that honored his coming. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they said. And here Lord is clearly a reference to God. They recognize that Jesus has come in the name of God, and so they bless him. To come in the name of the Lord is to be sent by God. And Jesus knew and said that he had been sent by the Father. To come in the name of the Lord is to come with the authority of God. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. And yet Jesus could tell men and women their sins were forgiven. And they were. To come in the name of the Lord is to represent God. And Jesus came announcing that the kingdom of God was at hand. Jesus most truly came in the name of the Lord. And for that reason, the people blessed him as he came, even if they didn't understand all that they were saying. But they were right to sing his praise. He is to be blessed for the very fact that he came. 
And he is to be blessed for the good news, the salvation, the life, the hope, the joy that he brought with him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so may he receive from us the very best of the praises that we can offer to him. And then they said, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. David was perhaps the greatest king that Israel ever had, a man after God's own heart. Oh, he got things wrong at times, but his heart was set on pleasing God. And one day he had a promise from God that his throne would last forever and that one of his descendants would be king forever. And the people looked forward to that day eagerly, not least when the ships were down, when they were under foreign rule, as they were in the days of Jesus and the Roman rule from which they longed to be set free. And so they hoped that the kingdom of their ancestor David will be restored in those days. And we see that in John's Gospel. When Jesus feeds the 5,000 with just the five loaves and the, the two fish, the crowds want to take Jesus and make him king by force. They were thinking, surely, surely he's the man who could rescue us from the Roman dominion. But that wasn't the reason Jesus had come. Yes, he came in the name of the Lord. Yes, he announced the kingdom of God was at hand. But his kingdom was really quite different. It wasn't like the kingdoms of this world. It wasn't built on force. Jesus is king. To that extent, they're right. But he was a different kind of king. And it seems they didn't really quite see that. He didn't quite grasp the significance of his riding on a colt. It was the message that he is the humble king. Riding into Jerusalem on the back of a young colt, Jesus makes a statement without even saying anything. A powerful general would ride in on a mighty horse, a, a symbol of his strength and his power. But Jesus chooses a colt. A young donkey and chooses to make that statement. Centuries before, Prophet Zechariah had written, Behold, look, your king, your king is coming to you, humble and riding on a donkey. Jesus chose a cult to show that he was king and that he was a humble king. We know as we read the Gospels how. Jesus lived in humility, in humble circumstances, spending time with those that others rejected, sharing with the poor and with the needy, and showing his humility in washing the feet of his disciples. In this coming week, we shall see how Jesus died in humility too. I've not come, he said, for everybody to run around and, and, and serve me. I've come in order to serve and to give my life as a ransom to set others free. He came in humility. He lived in humility. And he died in humility, giving his life that you and I may be set free from sin and live under his kingly reign. So Jesus chose a little donkey, not because he was tired, but to show what his kingdom is like. The crowds, they, they shout out his praise, and yet, maybe you don't quite grasp his type of kingship. Do you? And will you bow before him in worship today? We praise him because Jesus is Lord. We bless his name because Jesus is king. We shout out our hosannas today because Jesus is savior. And hosanna means simply save us, we pray. News about Jesus had spread widely. People had heard that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And now it was Passover time. Where many were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate God's act of deliverance. And in making them a nation. And so people were talking. Rumors were circulating. Could he, could Jesus of Nazareth be the Messiah that we've been hoping would come one day? And if he is, 
then they would immediately think that he would rescue them from the domination of the Roman Empire, and hence their shouts, save us. Many of our Bibles have a little footnote that invites us to turn back to Psalm 118, because many of the words that the crowds used in welcoming Jesus are to be found in that psalm. And Psalm 118 celebrated God working out his plan, no matter what opposition came against his chosen servant. And verse 25 has that cry, save us, we pray, O Lord. And those two Hebrew words, save and pray, together form the word that in English we know as Hosanna. Save us, we pray. I thought the Bible we see how God saved his people in so many ways. He saved them from drought and famine. He saved them from hunger. God saved them from their trouble and their distress. God saved them from danger and despair. God saved them from sickness and death. God saved them from their sins and their guilt. And Hosanna is a cry for God to save them again. But Hosanna often seems to be a shout of praise to the Savior also. It's difficult to know for sure how the people used the word, what they expected. They knew Psalm 118 was a messianic psalm. In other words, it spoke about the Messiah. Now, that doesn't mean that every detail, every line of the psalm is about the Messiah. Rather, it's to say that the experiences of an individual, or sometimes even the people of God, will in some way be experienced by the Messiah when he comes. And in addition, some parts can only refer to the coming great Messiah, for only he is able to do what they promise. What the people know is that the Messiah would be a king descended from King David, who would come and rescue them from foreign bondage and restore the glories of David's day with freedom and peace. The mission of King Jesus was greater still. He would extend the kingdom of God to the world. And Jesus would not only come as king, but he would also suffer and die for the world in order that we might be rescued from the greater enemies of sin and guilt and death and might know the forgiveness of God and his rule. Jesus, the Messiah came and laid down his life for us. As we begin Holy Week, let me ask you, is he Lord in your life? Is he King? Is he your Savior? Have you confessed your sins to him? Have you thanked him for dying upon the cross for you? Have you asked for his forgiveness? Fourthly and finally, let us consider how we respond in worship with all of our hearts. We sometimes talk about people going to town to describe when they act with great enthusiasm and make an extra special effort. In Mark 11, the people certainly go to town as they welcome Jesus with palm branches and clothes and hosannas. Palm branches were fairly flat and very leafy. And cutting them down didn't harm the trees. In fact, they would grow back again within months. From as early as the days of Moses, people would wave palm branches at the Festival of Tabernacles, a, a seven-day autumn festival that celebrated God's protection when they lived in tents. But more than just the palm branches, they used their own clothes too. The disciples took their outer garments and put them on the back of the colt to make a seat for the Lord. And then the crowds took off their garments and, and placed them on the road as Jesus came along. And to that, they added their hosannas, their prayers, their greetings, their praises. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Maybe some of that crowd were there among those who a few days later would shout, crucify him. And maybe we ought not to be too hard on them. 
They were under enormous pressure from powerful religious leaders. And I understand that they wouldn't want to be arrested themselves. But maybe we can also ask carefully, how deep was their response to Jesus at that time? More importantly, what's our response to him? The reading from Mark 11 concludes with Jesus going into the temple courts late in the day. Mark records simply, he looked around at everything. Jesus saw all that was going on and he, he noted it. And today, as Jesus looks around at us, he sees everything that's going on, including what's going on in here. Jesus knows our hearts. The last few weeks we have been reading through four chapters of the Gospel of Mark. And they've often touched on issues of the heart. The fig tree had lots of leaves, but no figs. There was an outward show, but there was no inner substance, no fruit of the heart. The temple. The temple courts were, were full of activity, but there was... No heart of prayer, of relationship with God. Some of the leaders would walk around in long flowing robes to, to impress and, and then offer long prayers in front of everyone to show off. But when it came to the heart, Jesus said that behind closed doors they were ripping off widows. One widow came into the temple courts and she put just two thin coins into the offering. While others came and put in large amounts, and quite right too, because they had lots, but that widow put in all that she had. And Jesus noticed. And then there was Mary, who anointed Jesus with that precious ointment, not just with a, a few drops carefully allowed to fall. Nothing that was half-hearted, it was everything. Mary held back nothing. Jesus knew her heart. And he knows our hearts too. As we come towards the end of Lent, as we begin this Holy Week, maybe you would like to take a few moments, just quietly once more, to just look at your heart in the presence of the Lord. What do you see? What does Jesus see? when he looks. May we be ready to confess where we hold back. May we be ready to offer once again our minds and our hearts and our wills, indeed our whole selves, to the Lord who laid down his life for us. And let us worship him with all of our hearts. Practice of the custom known as Angaria meant that a person of standing in a community could at any time ask to borrow an animal, and you were expected to say yes. The person would, in due course, return the animal to you. And that's why Jesus could borrow the colt on which he sat as he entered into Jerusalem. Jesus, who is Lord of all. Jesus, who is king and has the right to reign in your life and mine. Jesus, who is the saviour of the world, who humbly laid down his life for us. Therefore, our response should not be confined to the custom of Angaria. Our response should not be to let him borrow an hour or two of our lives. Ought not our response to be to submit the whole of our lives to his lordship? to live under his kingly reign, and to rejoice daily in our Saviour. Let us praise him with all of our hearts and in all that we do. Amen. Let's come and let's bring our prayers. Heavenly Father, we, at this moment in time, as we begin to approach Easter, we reflect on just how wonderful for us, but how costly for you, 
it was to send your son to earth. We recognize that in living his life in that first century Palestine environment, he met hostility. He met misunderstanding. He met challenges over the word of God. He met, however, a small but devoted crowd of people that will become his disciples. He met a crowd that was willing and wanted to hear what he had to say. We met a crowd who would bring their needs to Jesus, whether it was for healing, whether it was forgiveness, whether it was deliverance, whether it was food. As we come at this time approaching Easter, we want to say thank you with all our hearts that you cared enough to send your son. Father, forgive us the times that we do not bring our praise as we ought. Forgive us the times when we think more about ourselves than we think about you. We think about our comfort and not the cost to you. Father, as we come, we recognize that in many ways the crowd on Palm Sunday were fickle. For within a week they went from singing praises to demanding his death. And Father, too often we are fickle. We love to sing your praises on the Sunday and at the times when life is good. But we are so quick to be critical and denounce you when life is difficult. Father, in your actions you have proved that you love us that you want to forgive us. May it be that we understand enough of what Jesus did across that first century Easter to look to him for our forgiveness, to look to him for the way that we should be living our lives, to draw strength when we need strength. Father, we recognize that as we meet this Sunday in the UK, it is only a few days after the one-year anniversary of lockdown for COVID. We recognize that there are many people that are hurting. They are remembering loved ones that are no longer with them. They are perhaps mourning the loss of jobs or job opportunities. They are lonely because they have been confined to their own home or their own family and have been unable to mix with their friends and hold the usual social events that we enjoy so much. And Father, we would pray for them at this time that as we begin to move into what we anticipate will be a much better position that we will all find our peace our hope in you father as we recognize the actions that your son was prepared to take crossing the religious leaders of the time crossing the political divides of the time, submitting himself to what is only a desperately difficult situation. Father, may it be that we do not only follow you when it's easy and convenient. 
that indeed we too would be prepared to follow that example. I doubt whether anything so extreme would be demanded of us. But give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the boldness, give us the knowledge that when life is hard, you are there with us and we want to walk it with you and not on our own. And so, Father, we bring our prayers for ourselves. We bring our prayers for others as we seek comfort and consolation for them at this time of remembrance. We also pray for your church as it celebrates the wonderful, wonderful gift of God the wonderful opportunity to be forgiven, to find meaning and purpose in life. Help us, help your church to lead with that example. Help us to share the good news and not hold it to ourselves. Help us to introduce others to your Son, our Saviour, at this wonderful celebratory time. Amen.